Now, yesterday, we concluded uh, with um, the concept of uh, mingling with people for the sake of both identification and transformation. Um, we don't just mingle with people just to be sociable, but in the back of our minds, we pray and hope that to bring transformation to their lives. These two concepts must come together. Uh, and I get these two ideas from how, the way Jesus reached out to the woman caught in adultery. Uh, some people focus on either one of those things, either focus identification or focus on transformation. But we must include both together as Jesus did. Or we must start with identification that lead us to transformation. And uh, what do I mean by that specifically? Uh, when they all condemn her, want to stone her, and then uh, Jesus revealed to them their sins, and they left by one by one, and nobody threw a stone at her. And Jesus asked the woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? The woman answered, No one, sir. Then Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you, but, uh, but go and sin no more. That story is found in John 8, 2, 11. Let me break it down for us all here. And that is identification. He felt with her. He, he empathized with her. Uh, has no one condemned you? No one, sir. He said, I don't condemn you either. He identified with her. Why did he say that? But Jesus came to save. John 3.17, not to condemn. His mission <clears throat> is not condemnation, but salvation. So he was applying that mission statement to her in that situation. So he identified with her. Uh, but he also said, go and leave your life of sin or go and sin no more. And uh, that's transformation. So the Lord doesn't just want us to, uh, uh, doesn't want to only identify with us. He doesn't want to only uh, feel with us. His ultimate purpose is to see us change into his image. And so uh, it is wrong to go to either extreme. Uh, so many people today want to say, oh, I feel with you, uh, and approve of their behavior. And so it enables them to do more of the same. Jesus wants to accept us, identify with us, but he really longs to change us to be more like him. At the very um, end of the chapter, before just above discussion questions on page 64, 64, I like to read the statement. The last five lines or six lines on that page, the bottom of that page. It's all right for the church to be in the world. It's, it's okay for us to be in the world, provided the world is not in the church. And then he describes, the author describes the church as a ship in the ocean. The ship does not sink while it is launched into the water. We do not sink when we are in the world. But it sinks when the water goes into the ship. The ship fills with water and it sinks. The rescue work of the church, our work of witnessing, 
declines in direct proportion to how much the world invades the church. That's quite a statement. Um, the more we allow of the world to come to our lives and the church, the more we become worldly, the more our lives and the church tends to sink. Page 66. Uh, Jesus sympathized with people. We're going to learn about sympathy today. You know something? I had a hard time finding, because the book is full of illustrations and stories, every chapter is introduced with a story, plus it's punctuated with stories experienced in the chapter itself. It's concluded with a story. But this one, I had a hard time finding an introduction to use because the word sympathy in the Western world, at least, is not in vogue, uh, especially men. Men don't feel like they're sympathetic. Uh, have, you, have you heard um, the, the sentence that uh, when you show some sympathy to somebody, excuse me, I need no I need no sympathy. I don't know I don't want your sympathy. So sympathy is not always viewed in a positive light. So for that reason I had a hard time finding a story about a tough man who showed sympathy. I could find some experiences, stories about mothers. A woman who showed sympathy, but sympathy is not associated with something strong. But I wanted it, uh, it to I wanted it to show that tough men can show sympathy. After all, Jesus was a man, and he was tough, yet he showed deep sympathy for others. As you could tell from the story, I start with on page sixty-six. Um, it's quite a story. The Lord sent me that story. I read it in the Reader's Digest from all places. And it's about General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the commander of the Allied Forces, Supreme Commander in World War II, against Hitler, against the Nazis in Germany. That's how the story goes. The night before a big invasion across the Rhine River. General Eisenhower that evening, thinking about the next morning of invasion, he was walking, contemplating in his mind what was going to transpire. Along the way, he crossed paths with a soldier, maybe 18 years old, away from home, away from his farm in the States, and he greeted him this way. How are you doing? How are you feeling, my son? He cared about his feet in the midst of war and violence. And he called him son, as if he became his temporary father away from home. Uh, and the soldier responded, I feel awful nervous. He was being honest. I feel nervous. Who wouldn't be nervous? But uh, General Eisenhower took it the right way and he said, you and I are a good pair then because I feel that way too. Wow. He identified with, you know, I feel nervous too. And General Eisenhower was honest. He was nervous. Imagine thousands upon thousands of young men were going to be killed. But then Eisenhower said, maybe if we just walk together, we'll be good for each other. I thought that's an excellent way to describe a man as tough as General Eisenhower to show sympathy for these young soldiers. Let's walk together. We'll be good for each other. I feel like you do. Let's be together at this moment of crisis. Now, Jesus' ministry is associated 
with three words that are similar to each other. And on page 67, it's about the first word is sympathy coming from the Greek word sympathia, and that's the first and that's the that's the second paragraph on page 67. Sympathia, which means what? Uh, to feel with. Mm. Pathos means feeling. Uh, sin meaning together. So feeling together. Somebody's happy, feel happy with them. If somebody's sad, feel sad with them. It becomes it becomes more intensified. The second word associated with the ministry of Jesus is the word empathy, which comes from the Greek empathia, which means to feel, also to feel, but instead of with, is to feel um, to feel like you are in the same place as the other person, like to walk in somebody's shoes. It's a bit more intensified. And then the last one, which is on page 68 and 69, if you want to look into it, is compassion. And that's the most intense one that Jesus showed toward people. He showed compassion. Now, the word uh, the word compassion comes from the uh, a compound word, uh, com and pati, compati in Latin, uh, which means uh, to uh, suffer with. Now, in our culture, passion uh, is not really interpreted the right way because somebody can tell you, I have passion for ice cream. I have passion for my girlfriend. I have passion for a basketball game, which means they have intense joy. But in reality, it means pain. It means suffering. And of course, it's evident also uh, by the movie uh, Mel Gibson came up with. And what was the name of the movie? The Passions of Christ. And of course, the movie was very very graphic, showed pain and suffering of Jesus. So the sufferings of Jesus. And so, in other words, the example, uh, the example of uh, Jesus showing compassion over the leper. Uh, right there in Mark 1, verse 40. I'm looking at page 69, the first paragraph, Mark. 140 and when he when he uh, uh, saw the leper uh, who wanted to be healed he was moved with compassion and he touched him before he healed him again we have demonstration here of Jesus being people a uh, people oriented and then task oriented what was the task the leper desperately wanted to be healed he asked for healing but Jesus, the great healer, did not do that first. Before he healed him, he showed he was a real compassionate person by, uh, first of all, by mood with compassion. To do what? And his uh, move of compassion led him to uh, stretch for his hand and touch him. Uh, what does that mean? It meant Jesus was conveying the strong message to the leper. Even while you're a leper, I love you. Even while a leper, I touch you. I've been uh, to a leprosarium where I worked as a missionary in Africa. It's quite a sight to see a bunch of lepers and how they look and how... <laughs> how uh, nurses, uh, Adventist missionaries from different parts of the world minister to these uh, afflicted people. I remember a nurse from Sweden, uh, maybe about 22 years old, bending down to uh, 
to uh, apply medication to wipe the feet of this leper. Basically, he had no toes, he had no fingers, he had no nose. And she was just working with him for an hour or more. I couldn't believe seeing that. I, don't, I, I certainly couldn't have done that myself. I asked her a question afterwards. I said, why are you doing this? Why did you leave the, your country, your lecture of Sweden, to come here and work like that? She said, sir, I am moved with compassion for these poor people because Jesus said, that as much as you do to least of these, my children, you do it to me. I'm doing it for Jesus. Can you imagine if we take the same attitude? And that is, when we reach out to the least of these, we're actually reaching out to Jesus. That's a great motivator. So if you want to thank Jesus, if you want to show gratitude for Jesus, go it to the least of these, and you're giving it to Jesus himself. And so, um, in other words, just like Paul says, Jesus became sin who knows sin, that we might become the righteous of God in him. He also, in his compassion, he became a leper who knew no leprosy. That's what compassion is, very strong emotion. And Jesus was associated with these three, um, with three uh, virtues, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Now, I am moving forward. It doesn't mean what we're skipping is not important, but just with, I'm going to highlight some things. Look at page 73, the first paragraph. I'm saying this here because sympathy is not prevalent in our society. In fact, the more I live, the more I realize, you know, uh, society is not full of compassion for others. People are self-centered. And so I'm saying this because when you show genuine sympathy for others, they're touched by that because you don't see it very often. And I'm looking at uh, the middle, kind of the middle of the first paragraph on page 73. We're told in Ministry of Healing, page 163, that the inhumanity of man toward man is our greatest sin. What's our greatest sin? Our inhumanity, lack of sympathy for other people. Then I'm moving on. to page 77, want to make a point. And, uh, and the subheading is listen more than talk. It's amazing how much listening to people can really help you to witness. Just relax, listen to them, uh, sympathize, uh, see where they're coming from. What makes them tick it is much more profitable to listen and to talk. It's so easy to care to be carried away by talking. We want to present the truth. We want to tell them what we know. Relax. You'll have the chance to do that. Listen to them. Win their confidence. And and here, uh, I want to say something here. We should listen with the ears of God that we that we may speak the word of God. Listen with the ear of God. And when we win the trust of people, then we have uh, earned the right to, to share with them what's on our hearts. And then a spot on page 79, effective listening skills. I list several skills, how to listen effectively. Uh, one of the things I mentioned here is that often because we're so eager to share, to talk to people, while they are talking to us about something very important to them, we are preoccupied in forming an answer to give them or in forming our ideas. And while we're occupied in forming an answer, we're not hearing what they're saying. 
And so therefore, when they stop talking, we talk about something else and we give them the clear idea. We didn't hear what they said. We're just focusing too much on what we want to say. Um, on the very bottom of page 81, that's the end of the chapter, I conclude with this here. Um, and there is somebody Christ is source of true sympathy. And I'm looking at the second paragraph, right in the middle of the page. A pastor related an incident that took place in his church as a disheveled man apparently walked in off the street, right in the middle of his sermon. Hmm. So imagine being in that church in the middle of the sermon. The pastor was talking about the real sympathy of Jesus, this man, like maybe a uh, hobo, uh, just uh, a man of the street. Somebody who probably didn't take a shower for a long time. This smelled very good and the clothes were dirty and he just felt impressed to walk in the church for some reason. And the church was packed. And so... He was hoping to find a seat in the back so nobody would notice him, but there was no seat in the back and nobody offered him a seat. So the only thing he could do was to go forward in the aisle, the middle aisle. Again, looking every uh, seat, left and right, there was no uh, seat available. And so the only thing he could do was to go forward. Uh, and nobody offered him a seat. And no seat was empty. He ended up right in front of the preacher, in front of the pulpit. And he didn't want to keep standing so uh, to distract the people. So he sat down right there in front of the pulpit. And people didn't know what was going to happen. And an elderly deacon from the back saw what happened. And he stood up, walked with this man. And what he did, he sat, he put his arm around him and sat next to him. And they both listened to the sermon together. And the pastor, in the middle of that sermon about sympathy of Jesus, he said, this is genuine sympathy demonstrated right in front of you. To sit next to someone who's struggling. Put your arm around them. You don't have to say much. And the message was loud and clear. That's what true sympathy is about. Now, at the end of the chapter, discussion questions, you can look at page 81 and 82. Uh, then, in chapter 6, the title of it on page 83, Christ Met People's Needs. And I just want to say to you that there are two kinds of needs. What I call felt needs and real needs. What, what's a felt need? It's a need that's on the surface, a short-term need. What's, what's a real need? A real need is deeper, long-term need. But Jesus, first of all, met people's felt need, and then they really need. For example, the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus met his felt need. What was his felt need? For friendship, for acceptance. What was his real need? To be saved from his sins, one after the other. What was the felt need of the leper? To be touched. Nobody touched him for years. And then Jesus healed him from the physical leprosy and also from spiritual leprosy. So remember these two things here. First of all, felt need. Secondly, real need. I was given a Bible study. Uh, the pastor, Duarte, mentioned I start my pastor ministry in Idaho next door to you. 
And I was eager to give as many Bible studies as possible. I mean, I want to be successful. I want to baptize many people as possible. Nothing wrong with that, except, except I was carried away uh, by, uh, by that ambition. And I put aside meeting people's health needs. And here I came to this house. I was given Bible study. Once a week, uh, husband and wife together. And this time, it was the husband by himself. And I thought, well, maybe the wife is shopping or whatever. I give him Bible study. And I was waxing eloquent about the topic. And finally, this man could not listen anymore. He stopped me. He said, sir, look, please understand i'm not hearing a word you're saying because i am so worried i'm so concerned i came home from work and my wife left me a note saying i'm leaving you i'm taking the children and you'll never find me and i'm going to file for divorce he said that's what i'm worried about can i talk to you about i don't know what to do i don't know why she left i know we had some arguments had no idea she was going to take my children and, and go with them somewhere I can't even talk to. I cannot even find her. Can you please talk to me about that? And then we can talk about the Bible study. So he was reminding me, you got to address people's felt needs. That's why before I learned before you give a Bible study, you just chit, chit chat with people a little bit. Uh, how was your day? How was your day at work? Are you okay? Uh, in case they have something on their minds to share with you, let them share it with you. You say, well, that takes time. Of course it takes time. But you could tell them after you listen for a few moments from that hour of Bible study, you could just say, I see what you're telling me. I feel with you. I sympathize with you. Uh, let, let, let's finish the Bible study. I'll get back to that. We'll discuss it further. And so again, remember, you meet the felt need first and then the real needs after that um, th there's an interesting uh, paragraph at the bottom page 86 hierarchy of human needs we're talking about meeting people's needs and this psychologist Abraham Maslow he 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 listed them in priority and if you look at the top of 87 there you have them Five of them, and I wonder if, um, if Pastor Duarte, can you can you read those for me? Yes. What, what's yes. the first? What What's the first priority in human needs? First, the physical need. Physiological needs. Physiological needs, meaning uh, you know, meaning uh, food, water. I mean, remember when when the war was waging in Iraq? Even though bombs were everywhere, explosions, people were killed, but people were cooped up in bunkers, but they got hungry, thirsty. And so they braved being shot in order to get some food for them and their family. And what's the second need? The second need is need for safety. Need for safety. In other words, if people don't feel safe, how could they go around? I, I remember hearing the news, reading about it, that um, we Americans, uh, being good-hearted, were building schools, were building um, different facilities for people to use in Iraq. But people couldn't because they didn't feel safe. Why would I go to school if I could be killed on the way there? So you got to give people uh, meet the need of her safety. Then third, the need for belonging and love. I tell you something. One of our greatest things we can do in our churches is when people come to visit, even church members themselves, to look forward to the experience because they sense love. And they feel that they belong. 
that really touches people's hearts and they want to come back because they're loved. Research shows uh, 70 Adventist church members leave, not because so much of doctrine, maybe some, but most of them leave because they didn't feel a sense of belonging. They didn't feel genuine love. Uh, fourth, the need for self-esteem, self-worth. And by the way, self-esteem comes only for knowing Jesus because we know that Jesus gave his life for us. We are worth his life. That's how we develop genuine self-worth and esteem. And fifth, the need for self-actualization. And so we can keep this in mind and, and make sure that we meet the basic needs first before we move further. Um, page 88, and the subheading of reciprocity. What does the word reciprocity mean? Give and take. Give and take. Who is speaking? I can't see you. Me. <laughs> you? Okay, okay. There you are. No, I see you. You look like an engineer with all these things around <laughs> your ears and head. You look like a professional. And uh, so anyway, Pastor Dwarty, give and, and we surprise me, give and take. And that's what we should do in our witness like Jesus. <laughs> Did Jesus experience give and take? Yes. And by the way, let me add this here. Uh, genuine friendship doesn't really exist without reciprocity. If it's a one-way street, how long does it last? I've had very good friends from high school and college, and I really appreciate our friendship, but I was the only one who would take the initiative, uh, reach out, reach out, um, call, send a message, uh, and then after, like, at my age, after 35 years, no reciprocity. And I didn't believe that can exist, but it does. People are, you know, busy, self-centered. And so one time I, I, I said to one friend, I said, listen, it has been me taking initiative. I don't mind that. But I sure like to have some reciprocity, you know. And I said, I'm going to give you the chance to take some initiative. It has been now 15 years, never took the initiative. We must really follow the example of Jesus. No relationship continues without reciprocity. And how did Jesus demonstrate that? Uh, look at um, look at page 89. Jesus practiced reciprocity. And um, let's see. Uh, I want to ask somebody else besides Pastor Duarte to read for me something. Who is available to read? Is your assistant there, Pastor Duarte? I'm here. And yes. Can you please read? And uh, Jesus practiced with surprise on page 89. Can you read? Jesus as our great example in witnessing willingly ate dinner at Zacchaeus' house. Even though it was really the tax collector who needed help, Jesus provided him with an opportunity to serve and show him kindness. See Luke 19, 1 through 10. And even though he aided Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, in many ways, he frequently accepted and appreciated their gracious hospitality. See Luke 10, 38 to 42. Ellen White tells us that at the house, at the home of Lazarus, Jesus had often found rest. The Savior had no home of his own. He was dependent on the hospitality of his friends and disciples. He longed for human tenderness courtesy and affection. The Desire of wow. Age, page 524. Isn't that something? Jesus longed for human tenderness and affection. Mm. And he accepted it uh, to be our example. Now, 
it's interesting. It says here, he sought the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha because he had no home of his own. Let me add something else here. Uh, Jesus was put down by his brothers. They criticize him. They were an obstacle to advance of his ministry. Uh, in another book I wrote, I quote Ellen White saying that he did not feel welcome at home because his brothers persecuted him and they made his past thorny, obstruct him in every way and Jesus did not want to be around them. And so Jesus went to the house of Lazarus and his two sisters to just rest, to have some peace. He needed it, and they provided for him. Then uh, uh, the, the paragraph after, talking about Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the very source of the water of life, she sure needed him. But he also wanted to show he needed her. And uh, that's why he asked for a drink of water. You know, I mean, do me a favor. Even though you're a Samaritan woman, I'm not supposed to have any dealings with you, but I want a drink of water. And then he gave her the water of life. I want to ask you uh, about that story. Uh, if you look at the cover of the book, there's a picture of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And I want to ask you a question. And the question is, as you look at that picture, at the cover of the book, there you see Samaritan woman with her jar, Jesus talking to her, uh, Jake Swell. <clears throat> uh, there were three things to be accomplished. <clears throat> Number one, Jesus getting his drink of water because he was thirsty. Number two, she was supposed to take water to her town. And number three, Jesus was hungry. And the disciples were gone. That's why he was alone to get him some food. Now be careful how to answer this question. Because Jesus' witness was not overwork, but overflow. He, he did this naturally. He he bubbled with his witness. You know, it wasn't hard work, H-A-R-D. It was hard work, H-E-A-R-T. So I say it was an overwork. It was an overflow experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was so caught up in witnessing to her, it, it leading her to salvation. The question then is this. At that time, was any of these three tasks accomplished? Did Jesus get his drink of water? Did she take water to mm -hmm. her village? Uh, did Jesus eat? No. None mm -hmm. of them were accomplished. Uh, she was so excited about the water of life, <laughs> she forgot to give Jesus his drink of water, ran to tell his, his, her village people what she found. In the process of her excitement, she forgot the jar. So Jesus got not his ring. The, the villagers didn't get the water she was supposed to take to them or her family. Hmm. She got so excited. Jesus, finding Jesus was her priority. And she told him, look whom I found. Mm. He said, I want to go and see for ourselves. And when disciples came with plenty of food, they were shocked that Jesus wasn't hungry. I said, we are not hungry when we left you. You're very hungry. He said, well, I want to tell you, my food and drink is to do the will of my father. Mm. And so to me, when we witness, it's, it's not just hard work. Uh -uh. It comes from the heart and you're so caught up in the experience, you sometimes even don't feel hungry anymore or thirsty because serving God gives you all what you need in even a greater way. Uh, another statement 
on that same page of 89 is about the Samaritan people. And I'm looking at one, two, the third paragraph, middle of that paragraph. He accepted the hospitality of this despised people, the Samaritans. He slept with them under their roofs, mm -hmm. ate with them at their tables. And then the last paragraph, and pass it what, eh? Because I don't know other names. Can you read that last paragraph for me? It's a very moving paragraph from the Tsar of Ages. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he hoped his three disciples, his inner circle, Peter, John, and James, would stay awake and pray with him. The human heart longed for sympathy in, in suffering. This longing Christ felt to the very depth of his being. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those who, whom he had so often blessed and comforted. Wow. So that's how Jesus felt about being reciprocal. He comforted, he encouraged the disciples many times, but now in his time of need, he needed them to encourage him to stay awake with him, to pray with him. And then on page 90, I already explained that, felt needs and real needs, we already covered that. And, um, and then um, there is a, there's an experience I want to share at the end of this chapter. And that is uh, uh, a church member uh, who had her arm broken, she had a cast on it. And so the pastor came to visit her. Now, the cast was obvious to be seen by everybody. Some friends wrote some notes on it. You couldn't miss it. And I want to say that the broken arm represents the felt needs. The broken heart represented the real needs. Think of it this way. She said, my pastor came to see me and he totally focused on my broken heart, which was, in, which was okay, and focusing on her spiritual problems, her lethargy, uh, not coming to church frequently, not reading her Bible enough. Hmm. That's, you know, we all should do that. But that's what he focused on. That's all. And she said, my pastor would have been more effective if he took a minute or two, five minutes, to address my broken arm first on his way to address my broken heart. He could have said, you know, how, how did this happen? How long do you need to keep the cast on? Are you right-handed, left-handed? Are you able to do some cooking for the kids? Just, just show caring about my felt need, the broken arm, instead of going directly to the broken heart and ignore totally my broken arm that was so obvious. Of course, the broken heart is more important than the broken arm, but you got to start with the broken arm first in order to be effective to reach the broken heart. I thought that was a good, good example. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, let's see, yes, the bottom page 93. Uh, I would like to read that. I want us to hear every word. I thought of the so moving. And the title of that subheading is, We Can Always Do Something If Our Heart Into Reaching People. And this story is told about a soldier during World War I. He was mortally wounded in no man's land between the two lines of trenches. He called for his friend to come and help him. The friend returned to his officer and said, Sir, give me permission to go bring him back. The officer said, No. He'll be dead by the time you get there. 
but the caring friend persisted. I want to go there. I want to see him before he dies. Top of page 94 to finish the story. Finally, the officer relented and said, all right, go ahead. The soldier climbed out of the trench. He was hit by enemy fire. After a period of time, he came crawling back toward the trench, dragging his the body of his body. The officer said, What did you what did I tell you? He's dead and you are wounded. What did you accomplish? The soldier replied, Sir, he was not dead when I got there. When, I, when he saw me, he said, you know, I knew you would come. There's always something we can do. There's something always in our hand we can give to God. Uh, this man insisted to see his friend. And maybe when he got to him, when he was dying, he cradled his head in his arms. He spoke encouraging words to him. He brought him some comfort. And the soldier didn't die by himself. He died with his friend. He died knowing his friends cared enough to risk his life and be with him. Now then, we go to chapter 7. You know, the book has 12 chapters for 12 weeks. It's like a Sabbath or quarterly. Um, now then, Jesus won people's confidence or trust. L let me say this today. Trust is not very... Uh, it's not available in abundance. There's a lot of suspicion in the world between nations, a suspicion between uh, colleagues, even suspicion in the church. Sometimes enough, enough trust within the family itself. There is a crisis for trust. And we can't accomplish very much unless we win people's trust. A sacred responsibility. We want people's trust. We should keep that trust. I don't know how much I should emphasize that. There are some people who are itching uh, to spread rumors. Uh, you know, they. I, I know of a pastor. If somebody came to me in confidence. Please don't tell anybody. It's very private, very personal problem. And he mentioned the pulpit. Uh, we should really be very careful to protect people's privacy and... Uh, to keep their confidence. Um, and so I talk about that here, uh, a Christ of trust. And then on page 101, I list different things will help us win people's trust. I want to mention some of them. You notice on page 101, what's the first thing we should consider in winning people's trust? I look about halfway down is number one. We should have the best interest at heart. So when they talk to us, they know we are there for their good. We're there uh, as ones desiring their good. We have their best interest at heart. They went after number two to show unconditional love. We love you, we'll be friends. Unconditionally, if you join our church or not. And then on page 102, the third thing is personal sympathy. Uh, look at what uh, look what we hear about that desire of ages, page 151. As true Christians, we must listen to them, identify and sympathize, sympathize with them. Christ strong. Personal sympathy helps to win hearts. Four, 
meet people where they are. Five, acts of kindness. And that acts of kindness, the last five lines and the number five, much depends upon the manner in which you meet those who uh, whom you visit. You can take hold of a person's hand in greeting in such a way as to gain his confidence at once by the way you shake their hands, or in so called a manner that he will think you have no interest in him. Number six, ask for simple favors. And number seven on page 103, trust awakens trust. And all of that, you know, trust awakens trust. This trust awakens this trust. There are people I know who are not trustworthy. I know that. But I witnessed to. But then well on that, knowing they are not trustworthy, I took a risk to, a risk to trust them. Because trust can awaken trust. Look at God the Father, our Father in heaven. He entrusts us with Jesus, and we're not trustworthy. He came to his own, and his own received him not. They end up killing him. But trust awakens trust. Eventually, present the gospel, wins out. Satan will be defeated, and Christ will be triumphant. So, we, we trust people keeping our eyes open. As Jesus said, be as wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We have to be wise about it, but we have to take a risk in showing some trust to people. Otherwise, how would trust be awakening them, especially if everybody distrusts them? Um, and then on page 105, how to trust the difficult people to trust. There are people who are very difficult to trust. This gives you uh, six ideas. On this page and page 106, you can read this on your own. Then page 107, uh, subheading is balance, wisdom and inner sense. Uh, now, let me make more of a comment about a serpent and the dove. Isn't that interesting? that Jesus used two creatures. The serpent represents the devil, and the dove represents the Holy Spirit. It's amazing how Jesus used characteristics in both creatures. He said, at least we can learn to be prudent, to be wise from a serpent, but to be simple, to be trusting from a dove. And so the Holy Spirit helps us to balance these things out. And, and you know, when you are depending on God, that he guides you what to do under what circumstance. Yes, we trust people, but our eyes keep open. We're not just gullible, ignorant. We trust people in spite of the fact that they are not trusty sometimes, trustworthy. Page 108. Uh, look at... Number six. Number six. Page 108. And Brother Chan, I'd like you to read that for me. Thank you for being my helpers in reading. I see your faces. And I know you read well. Look at point six. We'll conclude with that. Uh, they need to know. They need to know that we must place ultimate trust in a perfect, unchangeable God and not in unstable human beings. If we do not direct them to Christ, we are setting them up for disappointment. We okay, just one, mo just one moment here. What I'm saying here is, yes, we need to develop trust among people. But our ultimate trust must be in the unchangeable Jesus. In other words, our trust to, for others is, is relative. Our trust in Jesus is absolute. Our trust of Jesus should come first. So this is the statement we're going to read from Ministry of Healing, page 486. Go ahead. We are prone to look. 
We are prone to look to our fellow men with sympathy and uplifting instead of looking to Jesus. In his mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us in order that we may learn the folly of trusting in men, in man and making flesh our arm. Let us trust fully, humbly, unselfishly in God. Ministry of Healing, page 486. That's quite a statement. It has been very helpful to me in my ministry, in my life, as I related to friends and people. I used to be quite disappointed in people. But now I'm not. Why? Because when I put too much trust in people, God, in his mercy and love, allowed them to disappoint me. Why? Because I was putting too much trust in them instead of trusting Jesus above all. So it wasn't something I could talk to them about or wonder why. Maybe they didn't even know. And I realized because of the statement, God loved me so much in order to draw me to him, to trust him absolutely, fully. He allowed some of these friends to disappoint me that I would draw closer to him and not put other people first. Mm. That's quite a statement. So now, you know, when, well, for the past so many decades, uh, you know, when, when friends disappoint you, when friends let you down, when friends betray you, I take this way. Well, the Lord is trying to tell me, don't depend on people too much. Depend on me. And when I realized this truth, I began to depend on God uh, and to trust him fully absolutely, then when people disappoint me, it wasn't a big blow. Because after all, Jesus, the Lord of Lords and Kings, is my best friend. I still trust him. He trusts me. And that will make up for any people who might disappoint us. Amen. Amen.